Everybody. Okay, just give people a few more seconds to join us and then we'll get started. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this trip report on the way forward for Middle East peace. I'm Dan Moriarty with the Mary Knoll Office for Global Concerns in Washington, DC. And today we will be hearing from two members of a delegation uh, that was sponsored by Churches for Middle East Peace that traveled in January to the West Bank, as well as to Jordan and Lebanon. But we'll start today with a prayer, and I'd like to begin by taking just a brief moment of silence for all the victims of the violence, the terrible violence happening today in the Holy Land. But especially, let's take this moment to pray for the children, the children who have died and those who live today in fear. And now we'll read a prayer for our partners at CAFO, the Catholic Foreign Aid Agency in England and Wales. The prayer is called the Prayer for Peace in Israel and Gaza. But as we'll be hearing, this conflict extends as well to the West Bank and to all of Palestine and even to neighboring countries. So we pray for peace in the whole Middle East. Christ, Prince of Peace, hear our prayer and lament. For our suffering sisters and brothers, our hearts are heavy as we witness lives torn apart, as we see the faces of frightened children and hear the pleas of those without water or food. We pray for the dead and the grieving, for the injured and the afraid. We pray for courage and perseverance for those working for healing and to bring aid. We pray for world leaders that they may strive for a just and lasting peace. God of new beginnings, in your, in your ways are compassion and hope. Open our hearts to dialogue and understanding. Lead us all to answer your call to become peacemakers today and all the days of our life. Amen. I'd like to introduce now our speakers today. Susan Gunn is my boss. She's the director of the Mary Knoll Office for Global Concerns here in Washington, DC, where she's worked since 2012. Before coming to Mary Knoll, among other things, she served with the National Council of Churches of the United States in China. And it was there that she met her husband and they now have three amazing daughters. And she is the most recent recipient of the Pax Christi Metro DC Baltimore Peacemaker of the Year Award. And Susan serves on the board of Churches for Middle East Peace. And Russ Testa is the co-director of the Office for Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation, JPIC, of the new Franciscan province in the United States, the province of Our Lady of Guadalupe. He has worked with the Friars in JPIC efforts for more than two decades and in church, justice, peace, and integrity of creation ministry for nearly 35 years. 
and he now lives in Baltimore and finds cooking and gardening as ways to wind down. So reach out to Russ to get an invitation to dinner. As we listen to Susan and Russ share today, please put your questions for them in the Q&A section you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, so as they occur to you, please write your questions there. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and so now I will hand it over to Russ. Thanks, Dan. It's uh, great to be with everyone today, kind of humbling to be able to share from this experience that uh, I was able to be a part of in Missouri. Incredible. And so we talk about the trip, kind of the overview of the trip. Um, next slide, please. Susan, I think you've got the slides. Oh, there we are. So one quick question or one quick thing to answer just before. Um, all this gets going on. Um, yes, this is being recorded. Uh, yes, you'll get a link when it's sent to you at the end, and we'll also send the slides as well. So, um, so you can see the pictures better. Um, but so the trip really was a, a long-term thing that was planned by Churches Middle East Peace well over a year ago. Um, so well before um, October 7th and the following, the, the atrocities that have continued to happen since then and that day on. Um, and it was designed to be kind of four sections. We'd start out with um, the first part in Jerusalem. And then we'd go to Jordan, go to Beirut. And then we were supposed to go to Iraq uh, originally, um, the northern part of Iraq, to see the Christian communities there. Um, the day before we were supposed to leave from Beirut to go to Erbil, um, the U.S. consulate was bombed in Erbil, and we were going to meet there the next day. So we figured, let's go back to uh, you know, to uh, the Jerusalem and the West Bank, in which in many ways actually helped the trip with some meetings that we were able to have that we couldn't have during that first time. So who did we meet with in this group, in this small delegation? We met with heads of churches in Jerusalem, um, including the patriarch, the Greek patriarch. The, you know, we also, also were able to meet um, with uh, Cardinal, the patriarch, the Latin patriarch, Bishop, Cardinal Pisabala. Um, here's Bishop Shamali, who we met with his first. We met with uh, other folks, uh, the Custos of the Holy Land, uh, Francisco Patton. And then, of course, we were staying uh, with folks in the Diocese of Jerusalem, the Anglican Diocese, and met with them. So that's kind of what we met with patriarchs as one of the people we met with. And then we also met with folks that were part of the Israeli-occupied uh, Palestinian territories, like community leaders, um, people that are kind of uh, on the ground that are kind of holding society together, including folks that are doing kind of care for uh, women's empowerment, groups of folks working with uh, um, human rights and civil society, both Israeli and uh, uh, G uh, Jewish and uh, Palestinian groups. And we also met with um, the Ramallah Friends School, which is a Quaker school, which is where this, this, picture, this picture comes from as a way of this really kind of fear out young people like that. This is interesting. We'll talk more about the impacts of that as we go forward. We also met with uh, Palestinian political leaders, including... Uh, President uh, Abbas, uh, Minister Shataya, who's the uh, kind of number two, as well as with um, Dr. Uh, Bargudi, who's uh, doing some work. We're trying to really, how do you keep the medical stuff going? I think an important piece, I think, from that picture, though, just so you can't read it as well in the screen, um, this was from Ramallah. Um, and uh, they were, we were right there at the time when they were just done celebrating Christmas which was actually very toned down this year, um, as many of you read. It was toned down because the, uh, uh, how can we celebrate this when we've got our brothers and sisters in Gaza being destroyed? And this, this, the site there, of the, the uh, kind of torn down where there was a, where there was a, a uh, Jesus in the, um, the manger was there. It says, Christian, Christmas is hope. Our hope never dies. I think that was something that kind of came part of a theme we heard a lot. We also met with government leaders, um, including uh, George Knoll, who's the chief of the Office for the Palestinian Affairs, as well as folks from the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. And we also met, met with the ambassador to Jordan um, as well. So we met with some also U.S. government leaders um, as we we're part of our, our message there. Next, please. When we were in Jordan, <clears throat> we met with, again, lots of church leaders. 
um, as well as governmental leaders. Um, so, and parts of the royal family um, who have a key part to play. One of the things you'll see is the takeaway with this in Jordan is Jordan is kind of one of the, the one of the countries and the, particularly the Jordanian government really trying to keep different groups talking to each other. They're often sidelined more than they should be, which is a challenge, but I think there's an interesting role they're trying to play. We also met with folks from the American Friends Service Committee, which gave us some impacts as far as some of the other aspects around the way that uh, aid is getting into and not getting into, frankly, in, in Gaza. And then we were in Lebanon. We met primarily with church leaders and folks associated with different church leaders, um, including uh, Maronite Patriarch uh, Boutros, um, all right. And, um, and actually, it was, it was kind of one of those interesting dynamic things that happened. It was our last day. We were trying to do something a little more kind of casual in Beirut. And so we were visiting uh, that shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon. We met the pre we met a Maronite priest there who then said, hey, do you know that uh, Bishop Gregory Mansour, who's an American bishop in town, so we called him and he said, come on down the road. And that's how we got the meeting with the patriarch. And so there's these very kind of wholly miraculous ways of getting some of these meetings to go. We also met with a bunch of, um, a number of students there in, in Lebanon as well, some kind of civic leaders. And it kind of helped us to kind of understand how the impact of Gaza and the wider occupation continues to impact uh, Lebanon. One of the last kind of one of the key things we really kind of in the transition, our last day of kind of the first part of that trip to Jerusalem, we had a live ceasefire prayer service um, on the basically this holy site of the Mount of Olives. I'm going to split it. And um, it was one of these kind of ways that came together was really incredible the way that for groups were bringing there. We had uh, Jack Sarah from Bethlehem Bible College preaching some of the homily. Father Sebastian, who's the friar that's oversees the site there. And this was this prayer that was happening, announced, uh, which we'll talk about at the end, the kind of the uh, Gaza pilgrimage for peace, uh, or ceasefire pilgrimage. The Gaza ceasefire pilgrimage is different than what's going on. Now, the reason that also there's a picture for some of you might recognize up in the upper left, where there's also that same day, a few hours later, um, or a few hours earlier, I got mixed up on the time. Um, They're also meeting as a part of a huge protest uh, and a huge then a prayer thing at the end, um, right in front of the White House. And so these two events were kind of happening simultaneously for continuing this prayer for peace and trying to work towards our message consistently was we are we as part of these churches are working for a ceasefire. We're working for humanitarian relief and we're looking for ultimately a longer term solution to the end of the occupation. So now, Susan, if you want to talk about some of the things we kind of realized in this and kind of each of the sections, we'll start with Gaza. Thank you, Russ. So I was with the delegation uh, for their time in Jerusalem and in the West Bank. Uh, the, we went to Bethlehem and Ramallah in the West Bank. Uh, and I'm going to speak to that now, what we saw, what we heard from the people there and the impressions it gave to us. We did not cross over into Gaza, but Gaza and the suffering of Gaza was first and foremost on everyone's mind and in every conversation. Um, so I just want to um, point out the latest numbers from OCHA, which is the UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And um, they're, they're quite shocking. So as of today in Gaza, uh, OCHA is reporting 27,708 have been killed, 67,147 people injured, 24,000 children who have lost one or more parent, and an estimated more than 10,000 children killed. Those numbers were never far from our minds, knowing that Gaza itself wasn't far from where we were. Uh, the Christian community in Gaza, we heard from uh, the Latin Patriarch and the Greek Orthodox Patriarch and also the leadership of the Episcopal Diocese about their churches, their schools, and their hospitals in Gaza, that the Christian community of about 800 is sheltering in two church compounds and they're holding on 
Um, the Israeli government made some efforts to try to move Christians out of Gaza uh, to make it more clearly a Muslim versus Jewish conflict. Uh, but the communities decided not to leave. Um, they said they feared uh, permanent displacement, uh, is what we heard from the Latin patriarch. Uh, strong solidarity between the Christian and the Muslim communities uh, in Gaza and in the region, recognizing um, their, their suffering and the, the limitations that they have uh, in movement uh, and in, in their human rights. Uh, relief efforts, as you've been hearing, uh, are, have been uh, definitely limited by bureaucracy, red tape, and accusations. Um, so uh, we also have had meetings uh, with rep official representatives uh, from Egypt about the crossing where aid could get in. It's important to note that prior to October 7th, more than 500 uh, humanitarian aid trucks a day were needed to go into Gaza. So this was a community already um, strained uh, by the blockade. And then after October 7th, uh, now maybe 100 uh, trucks a day coming in with aid. So clearly not enough even on a good day. And, and we're in a complete crisis now. Lastly, there have been some miracles. Uh, namely, it's a miracle that not more deaths or disease at this point. Uh, what we're hearing from the UN is an expectation by the end of February of starvation. So here it is, uh, February 8th, and the time to act was already passed. Uh, we've reached uh, desperate times. Um, so our being there and hearing their their concerns, their worries, the struggles of the um, church leadership in Jerusalem to stay in contact with their communities and to get aid to them. It made me realize that the reality on the ground is so much worse than what we are hearing in the news here or for, from friends who might have a connection. The tension is so high. Yet one more miracle that Bishop Shamali at the Latin Patriarch mentioned to us is that the water well at the Holy Family Catholic Church uh, is still flowing. It hasn't run dry miraculously. Uh, it is really the was the good thinking of whoever dug the well uh, at the very beginning when they um, first constructed it, that they went deep enough or they tapped a stream because now there are about 500 people staying there um, each day using this well and they had braced themselves for the well running dry and that has yet to happen. I'm in a little trouble with the slides. Let me see. If I there you go. Um, we also went to the West Bank and we had um, a meeting with a large meeting. You see a photo at the top of many people. Those are Christian pastors in Bethlehem um, and Jerusalem. And we all came together for a dinner one night and just let them speak freely about their own personal experiences and the experiences of their of their churches that they shepherd. Uh, and they talked about lockdown uh, and being in the West Bank, they are occupied. Uh, there is occupation. The Israeli forces are there, are arresting people. And then also there are settlements um, that the European governments have um, uh, have declared as illegal, but the United States um, has not. Um, so these the the pressure from the from the settlements and the uh, IDF. Um, Israeli Defense Forces um, conducting raids and arrests as a tremendous tension uh, on the people uh, in the West Bank who wonder what's going to happen next. Um, they all have a strong connection to Gaza, that so many of them have family and friends uh, in Gaza, um, and they are just uh, desperate with um, fear and grief for their loved ones and um, afraid for when the shoe's going to drop in the West Bank and um, they'll it will they experience uh, similar um, attacks by uh, the Israeli army. The last photo there in the bottom with the large 
red sign that's on its side. I want to explain what that is. So there are checkpoints to enter the West Bank uh, from Israel, and we processed through them when we drove from Jerusalem into the West Bank, and then we'd have to cross back again. Um, after I had left and Russ was still there um, with the rest of the delegation, um, and they were traveling to uh, Bethlehem from Jerusalem, the road was suddenly closed. This is uh, rubble that um, the Israeli uh, army placed in the middle of the road to block off access to the checkpoint. Now, it's not uh, terribly far. Uh, without traffic, it should it should take less than 30 minutes. This ended up being a two hour ordeal to turn around and find an alternative road. And it wasn't the first alternative that worked. You know, the a side entrance that most people knew of was also blocked off with rubble in the road. So this is a known tactic to um, disrupt and control uh, the movement of people. Um, so everyday life, their economic um, ability to go to work and um, care for their families uh, is limited uh, by this extreme uh, uh, control of uh, their freedom of movement and their need for permits to travel. And right now permits ha have stopped. I'm gonna hand it off to Russ because he joined the delegation in Jordan and Lebanon. Okay, my camera back on here. There we go. Um, one last piece that before we move on just from the occupied territories is, was um, interesting. One of the things that um, we talk about the raids and the arrests that are happening um, in the, the occupied territories, though they started seeing an increase in those um, well before October 7th. And so there was already a sense of trying to lock down that area. Um, and it was just, it was a fascinating dynamic of uh, where you see that. Um, we were trying to, uh, we, one, one day we were trying to get this one village, uh, the second part of our trip there, um, outside of Bethlehem and Ramallah, which are a little more open, so to speak. Um, and we couldn't find the back entrance. And then suddenly the Israeli Defense Forces kind of came up behind us in the truck. It was a rather tense moment. Um, and then they started to lead us into the village. Now, we, they turned off before we entered the village because the last thing you want to do is enter into a Palestinian village being led by the Israeli Defense Forces um, as your... Um, as your as your guide um, to certainly to destroy any sort of sense of credibility we have of being peacemakers um, in the village. Um, the interesting thing about that story, I think this is important though, too, is that the Israeli Defense Force were generally concerned for our safety because their sense was this is a dangerous area. Whereas we did not feel any sense of danger going into the village, we felt that sense of danger from the defense forces. And so I think that sense of where understanding the, the the way that people are living in really two different worlds and two different narratives. I think we'll hear that kind of coming through as we kind of talk about some of our takeaways. Um, but as we move to, our, as I moved with the rest of the group, some of the rest of the group to Jordan and Lebanon, some of the kind of things that came out particularly is just the way that these economies and societies both in Jordan and Lebanon are in crisis mode. Their economies are nearly in shambles. Um, both countries rely significantly upon tourists and pilgrims to come. Um, to visit different holy sites. And that's just not happening. I mean, uh, for any event who has been to, had the opportunity to go to the Holy Land, um, one of our first days, we were in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And we're, and usually in that church, there's standing room only. And we basically had it all, all but to ourselves, um, the group in our group. And it's the same way walking through the streets of, uh, of any of these sites it was that way. And so that's added to this, as well as the inability of people to, to move. There's a lot of cross-border trade that's not happening now between Jordan and Lebanon. The other piece that's happening in Lebanon is because the South is being bombarded um, by the Israelis and, and Hezbollah is firing back at the Israelis. Most of the Southern part of Lebanon is being depopulated for their own safety, just as much as the Northern part of uh, of, of Israel has. And they're also using, though, at the same time, there's been um, documentation of the, the, that white phosphorus is being used to bombard parts of the parts of southern Jordan. 
which that will not only hurt just not only does it hurt people, but also destroys the land. So it's going to be that ongoing kind of crisis mode. And it's leading to this sense of just adding to that refugee crisis. There's already a huge number of refugees that is the challenge um, from Syria, from previous uh, movements of Palestinians out of out of out of Israel into and, and the, out of the occupied territories into Lebanon. Um, that's happened. And that's being added to now by 100,000 people displaced in southern Jordan, now finding places, so, southern Lebanon, excuse me, being displaced. Um, you also have large amounts of refugees in Jordan um, from both the occupied territories and also fleeing. And so the sense of this adds more to their crisis, as well as the, I think the attitude we're finding, um, we heard about a lot of young people, is there, we had great opportunities to meet with a couple of different groups of schools in both Jordan and both, um, um, and then also in, in Lebanon. And the young people are just like this really good sense of their future, but they also have a sense of realism that if there's a way for them to leave the area, they will. And so do you see this kind of ongoing brain drain that's happening? Um, that's that's um, that's a terrible kind of, I think, lost people in the sense of loss of future. Um, the, the last thing I would just say in this in the piece of this, um, as far as their experience with Jordan and Lebanon, is there's a real sense of the way the churches are really united together in Jordan and Lebanon. They really are working together, and they're working, when I say the churches, the Christian communities, but also working very closely with the Muslim community. There isn't this sense of tension, necessarily, that's on a regular basis. Yes, there are incidents like in there anywhere, um, but as a whole, there's not that sense of tension that happens, other than uh, what they're finding in Jordan and in Lebanon, there are groups of Christians coming in that are doing proselytizing, and they're doing proselytizing with the Muslim community, and it's causing now frictions between the Muslims and the Christian communities. And a lot of this is supported by the the this, this sense of a uh, um, of of how do you have this right thing as opposed to kind of this united faith trying to figure out how we work together. The other piece I think that's important in Jordan and Lebanon is that. Just as what Susan was saying about the sense of Gaza, there's a sense of Gaza and the experience of Gaza clearly present with them in Jordan, Lebanon, by the church people there, as well as the everyday people we talk to on the streets. Um, and the sense of like concern that they may be next, um, that there would be an invasion of, 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 of Lebanon, um, that there would be ongoing kind of crisis that can actually even topple uh, governments. And so there's this sense of living on the edge and living in crisis mode, um, which I think so. Um, we can move on from there. Next slide. So this is back to you, Susan. Start this. Thanks, Russ. So we had many impressions and takeaways, and I, I'm grateful uh, to have this discipline with you today to really try to organize my thoughts about this, because first and foremost, the trauma is society-wide, uh, and it's it's right in your face. This photo here was uh, right when you get off the plane in Tel Aviv, and everyone has to lock, walk down this long corridor. These are posters with the faces and description of each hostage taken by Hamas. And so the trauma is, for all is uh, just visceral. Uh, most every Jewish Israeli knows someone killed, injured, or, or taken hostage by Hamas on October 7th. And this shared trauma impacts the mindset uh, and the well-being of Israelis. Uh, and the government was was described to us by Jewish Israelis um, that they they feel their government is um, has a sense of humiliation for the attack on October seventh and is operating in uh, a sense of retaliation and they don't have a clear military plan uh, for what they're actually doing today. Um, so that's that's a dangerous combination. Um, yet the values of the people that we um, met with, um, Jews and um, Muslims in Israel, uh, in Palestine, um, were still strong. Uh, hospitality, courage, humanity. I was treated very well uh, by all. Um, uh, and I want to say that clearly. 
I also want to say that it was recognized by everyone we met with that what's happening in Gaza um, is bad for everyone, um, that it is just deepening um, resentment and um, uh, distrust, anger um, that will uh, affect generations. Um, and that anger includes anger directed towards the United States, um, President Biden, and to Christians, um, since the United States is um, recognized by many as a Christian nation. Uh, so uh, we're a part of it. Uh, we are um, a, a part of this problem. It's really a domestic issue because uh, so much of our U.S. budget is um, going towards um aid to the um, Israeli military, but then also um, the rising um, anger and um, even hatred towards the United States throughout the region. This one sign of hope that people brought up again and again uh, when we spoke with them was the case before the International Criminal Court. And what they would say is we're so grateful for what South Africa is doing for us. That's the way they phrased it, um, often mentioning South Africa, um, that they felt a solidarity um, and a support uh, in, a, in a deeply personal way uh, with the people of South Africa for speaking up for them there. Um, but I wanna speak uh, about this regional conflict. Um, we feel the delegation, uh, since we were there and as Russ said, they had to cancel their segment uh, to uh, Iraq because of the of of the violence. The regional conflict is happening now. Uh, it is already happening, and it's beyond Israel and Hamas. It's beyond Israel and Palestine. Um, and without a ceasefire and end to the fighting, the fear is that it will draw in even more people, more countries, more violence, um, deeper, longer protracted. Um, so knowing that, um, I believe that the United States um, for international interests, for humanity's interests and for self-interests, um, uh, it would be wise, it would be rational to call for a ceasefire and to work towards release of the hostages um, to, to make that a primary primary concern and the release of all prisoners held by uh, Israel without charge and the flow of enough humanitarian aid. Um, only that will stop the growing uh, regional tension. I can get the slides to obey. There, the other impression we got, and this gets to one of the questions I saw that I had, you know, kind of even raised a little bit, is this that there's a really need for strong U.S. voices for a ceasefire. Um, if we're going to move forward in the process of the, the goals, um, you've, you've got to get a ceasefire, release of all hostages, and humanitarian aid is that first step. There's got to be a credibility that comes from that. And there's got to be a credibility that's going to force the, some of the Palestinian governmental folks to step up in ways that maybe they haven't been able to in the past. Um, um, it's gonna also force um, kind of some kind of sense of like, do, do the Israeli government follow through? Do the Palestinian government follow through? And there's that challenge. There's a challenge that there's not a clear sense of, of a Palestinian kind of grouping. We met with the Palestinian Authority um, and it's, it's kind of seen that they are strong leaders in the area around Bethlehem and Ramallah Outside the occupied territories, they, the territories they have less, they have less, in, they have less kind of respect uh, for them. They've seen as less in charge, and so there's going to need to be some some efforts made, um, particularly with the help I think of the U.S. government. I think asking for the leadership of Palestinians more. And that's the other piece that comes out of this. The Palestinians um, are often kind of not at the table when they're being asked about what to do with their own future. So this becomes one of I think our asks in this. So that need for U.S. Christians to be a large, large part of this voice. Um, I think the other, you know, the, that all that can only happen then if those things happen, then that can get us the possibility of seeing a, a viable Palestinian state side by side with a secure Israeli state. I mean, it just becomes that long term goal that we're all kind of working towards. One more thing on the need for Christian voices. I, I did ask, um, I had the opportunity kind of in the second part of being in um 
Jerusalem um, to meet with uh, was a small group. He met with uh, um, um, Cardinal Pizabala and also um, uh, the Custos Father uh, Patton, who's the head of the Franciscans um, of the Holy Land custody. And one of my questions to both of them is that some of our concerns we sometimes hear is, you know, that we have as Franciscans in the United States sometimes and other church leaders is if we speak out, um, does that have a negative impact upon you um, in reaction from the Israeli government? And the answer I was very surprised by from uh, from Father Patton, the Kustos, was very clearly that we need you to be speaking out because we cannot. We need to have that strong voice and seeing Christians um, showing a different way forward. Um, and that was something that I had not heard from him before. Um, maybe he had said it before and hadn't heard that. And I heard it from other Franciscans in the area as well as other church leaders. That really strong sense of saying that there's a there there is a strong sense of how do we bring this different message, this different approach uh, towards a ceasefire and towards peace in the the Middle East. And so that was kind of reassuring, I think, in kind of a, uh, one of my signs of hope is that they need us. And the other piece, I think it was interesting that even like Cardinal Pizabala was mentioning that they need us to show how do you do good interfaith dialogue anymore? Because that's now almost impossible to do, um, at least as far as Jewish Christian Muslim uh, dialogue. Um, you can see a lot of Christian Muslim dialogue in the Middle East and working together, but you don't see the three Abrahamic faiths working together there very much anymore. And so they need examples of that. So it's that that dynamic of what they're looking for us to be as a Christian church in the United States. Now, there are some challenges as far as, as I, we kind of mentioned, there's now no clear Palestinian leadership yet. Um, there's clearly a lack of trust of the Israeli and the U.S. And so the role that the U.S. is going to have to play as far as doing peace building and our kind of confidence building in the process of that. Um, well, I think the other piece and the settlements are going to be a huge issue um, because the only time I felt unsafe um, in, in in the entire time I was there is when we had to stop for gas at a at a, at a, a settlement gas station. Um, it was outside of the settlement, but it was run by the community. And everyone had, you know, guns on their holster and carrying long guns. I mean, yes, the Israeli military was had guns, but here's a sense of folks where you just never knew if somebody was going to send something off. And so there was a sense of like, and I, I had just a small taste. I mean, I don't even think I can even, it's not even anything with what the people that are living their day to day are feeling, but that small sense of that taste of just that concern where the settlements are really destabilizing more and more of, of and, and the role the U.S. is playing in keeping those going. So what do we do? What's our call to action? And then we'll have some time for answering some of your questions. Like I said, we've got to be visibly active as people of faith. We, we've got to be out there, um, particularly pushing our churches, pushing our governments. Um, we can do this in prayers of the faithful and daily prayer. We've got to bring that in that the prayers of the faithful are a great way of bringing this into our, our daily and regular worship. But there's also going to be, and we'll see the there's a link for this coming up into the the into the um to the uh, chat, these this Gaza ceasefire pilgrimages during Lent. Um, this is an international effort um, to basically walk 25 miles during Lent. Now, you don't do it all at once. Um, we can do it in kind of a sections. Um, but it's 25 miles it shows because that's the length of Gaza. And it's trying to do this and hopefully trying to get some media coverage locally to kind of, again, raise the pressure upon our government in a way that's respects our Christian way of approaching this, um, to to call for the ceasefire, humanitarian relief, you know, and hostages to to be returned. Another one that's happening right now or we're gonna be um is um is these March for from Philadelphia to DC. Is it in April or is it actually in February? I can't remember yet, but um um that um this this March to, to from Philadelphia to DC is another kind of pilgrimage. There's different pilgrimages, different walks to do. And again, all these things can help us to um, kind of raise the public view of this. Um, there will be, if you are in the D.C. area, there's Nash Wednesday service outside of the White House on February 14th. Um, and um, you can do that. There's also a need to, again, like we said, constant advocacy for ceasefire, these hostages and humanitarian aid. And you'll see links to CMEP, uh, Church of Middle East Peace is a I mean, granted, yes, I mean, we're very proud of that organization being a part of it, 
Um, but they they offer a real credible, trusted source of where they're working with different groups. Some of the people we met with were um, Israeli peacemaking groups and Israeli groups that didn't agree with us at all. But just we have that kind of credibility to be with those groups while we're there. And then Mary and all, of course, um, we all know um, what's, what's great with that. Um, so, um, and then finally, um, if you are able to come to it, um, there will be, this is the 40th anniversary of Church of Middle East Peace. Um, and um, April 9th through 11th, there's an advocacy summit where we'll be at the end of an opportunity because hopefully by that time we've gotten a ceasefire, um, we'll really pray, um, but allow us an opportunity to kind of um, add the other advocacy. This is a long-term um, thing that's going to happen. I think there's now a focus on this that there hasn't been before. And then the last thing I would say, just as kind of a sign of hope, um, the picture in that far, the bottom left of your screen is that camel is only about 15 minutes old. There's this, we were, as we were driving to, uh, from Israel, uh, from the Palestine to Jordan, we, we, we saw these Bedouin um, across, next, to the, down, next to the road. And there's that, that sense of hope that they are trying to continue to live on. I don't know. I just, I found great hope in that. I don't know. It's maybe my own weird way of being into farming, but um, that just that sense of like life can continue if we hold on to it, that sense of joy um, in that new life that we can try to figure out how do we hold on to that. So I think that um, it's now time for Q&A. Right. Yes. We've got a lot of uh, good, challenging questions coming in. So I'll look at a few of them here. Um, one just uh, factual kind of question uh, was if you can speak to uh, what you may have heard about the, specifically the bombing of churches, the the bombing of the Orthodox Church in Gaza and the sniper killing and rocket attacks on the Catholic Church there. Uh, yeah, I didn't speak to that. Um, you know, that was prior to our visit. So I heard from colleagues who work at Catholic Relief Service, frustration about that because they had provided the exact coordinates of the locations of those sites to members of Congress who were relaying them to the Israeli um, military. Um, so they were on the list of protected sites. And um, when the bombing happened and uh, when also there was a sniper attack uh, at one of the church compounds, that, that's when two women died, um, the response um, each time was fog of war it's just the this is what happens um and that's the end of the conversation um so it's really frustrating yeah both um um Mr. Shamali and the Night Patriarch did talk about those those attacks and just yeah are they and the outrage they couldn't really express to this little government about it all Selves. So it's our job to do that. You're muted, Dan. Thank you. And uh, maybe to that point, there were a couple questions, and I know this can be a tough uh question, but about what you've heard from um the Catholic hierarchy on the need for a ceasefire. Uh maybe here in the U.S. or in uh, the Holy Land uh, or globally? Um, I think there's frustration. Um, clearly that was expressed by some of our Catholic leaders over there that the U.S. church um, outside of um, religious communities has not been more visibly actively calling for a ceasefire. Um, I think there's some frustration with that clearly that we heard. Um, that I think many of us share. And I think it's, um, I, we can always come back to that, that we are the church. So I think it's up, so it's up to us just how do we keep making sure that, you know, that our voice is out there. Um, the bishops don't only speak for us, we speak for ourselves as well. 
And a couple have signed on to a ceasefire recently too. So we've got that going. Yes. Um, uh, and you spoke a little bit to this, but maybe you could, it, it, there is kind of some confusion. It sounds like in a, uh, a few of the questions referred to this about what we read in reports about the um, support or lack thereof for Hamas among Palestinians. And then more generally, because uh, I know you also met with Palestinian Authority uh, leadership um, about the, a lack of faith in in leadership in general among Palestinians, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. We do. We met with the leadership of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, and that is a separate, uh, wholly separate uh, from Hamas. Um, so the Palestinian Authority uh, has governmental authority over West Bank and social services there and government services, and not currently in Gaza. Uh, they express to us a hope uh, and a readiness and a willingness to to return to Gaza in a, in a place of leadership. But um, people were free in conversation uh, to with us that they don't have confidence in the uh, Palestinian Authority in in their capacity to take it on as well as their um, just um, their um, maybe a level of corruption that that would make it uh, untenable. I think also just I mean the Palestinian Authority has been um, every chance the Israeli government has gotten they often will try to undercut. The Palestinian Authority, um, that's been one of their challenges. Um, that's not to say that they don't have their own issues to deal with. I think the other thing that was very clear, though, that was um, I cannot remember anyone saying anything positive about Hamas in the October 7th piece. I mean, that was very clearly um, decried to us by Palestinian government theory, authorities and stuff like that, people like that, as well as all the church people. Um, at the same time, I think they also understand um, that they were the only government, I mean, quotes around it, maybe scare quotes around it, um, that there was in Hamas at the time, um, or in Gaza at the time. And so I think there's that challenge of how they're trying to figure out how does this work out? I don't think there's a support for Hamas, um, but I think there's also the sense of like, um, what else are we going to do? Who else are we going to turn to? And so I think there's that kind of sense of lack of choices. Um, and those have been deliberate things that have been done by choices made by who the US government recognizes and doesn't recognize and um, who the Israeli government recognizes and doesn't recognize. And so there's, these are not independent of themselves. I think it's an important piece to understand. We could have a whole nother webinar by people more qualified than me to talk about that. Thank you. Um, just to keep the the challenging questions coming, uh, there were a few different questions in reference to, I know on one of the slides, it referred to the long-term goal of a two-state solution, uh, which is this one solution that I know uh, both the US government and, and, uh, and Pope Francis have referred to as a goal, but, um, but there's also skepticism about how possible that is at this point, given settlements and uh, how desirable it is, given uh, just the the desire to see people live more integrally in, in peace in the region. So can you speak a little bit more to kind of who is supporting that and who might not be and, and uh, why that's listed as a as a long term goal, as opposed to maybe a, a solution yet to be defined or a one state solution? I'd like to answer that. That exact question came up on a, a briefing that I was part of uh, earlier today for Congress. It was a, a small group of people were on the delegation and we were offering um, this very similar format to uh, staff members of congressional offices. And that question came up. And uh, Bishop Shamali uh, in Jerusalem, 
uh, was uh, on the Zoom because this was a virtual meeting. Uh, and he answered it uh, first uh, mm -hmm. that uh, a two-state solution um, is the only way to um, maintain human dignity uh, and, and life. Uh, and he said, we have to be, um, we have to be, uh, as Christians, ruled by the truth. The truth is the way to peace. We have to have courage to speak the truth. So while it's not popular and uh, it's been abused over the years, uh, maybe by people when they when they have other goals in mind, and it's helpful to disrupt um, efforts towards a two state solution. Uh, now in this conflict and in this moment. Um, it does seem to be um, the answer, but how do we get there? And uh, the how part, uh, that was the second part of your question. Um, today at the briefing, um, uh, Reverend Dr. May Cannon, the executive director of Churches for Middle East Peace, she answered that by saying uh, an end to the settlements and an end to the occupation. We cannot um, adopt in principle a uh, two-state solution. Uh, you know, the negotiations that are happening in Paris right now, we couldn't have that as on the table um, without ending the injustices of the settlements and the occupation. So those need to be addressed. And they sound huge because we've been facing off, we've been stuck uh, on those issues for so many years now. Um, but this conflict in the October 7th told us that this, this conflict can't be managed. It needs to be solved. It needs to be addressed. And we, we had the opportunity to meet um, with some human rights activists um, in the West Bank um, for dinner one night. And I remember one of them said to me, I like to say that sometimes the obstacle before you is the way forward. So um, honestly, addressing um, the obstacle in front of us is the only way. So it takes um, maybe uh, Christians guided by our faith to speak the truth um, to reach a peaceful solution. The only thing I would add to that is just that, remember that's the, if we don't, Get a ceasefire, humanitarian relief, return of hostages, and the return of prisoners in exchange. None of that's going to happen. So it's that first thing, because if it's going to, it's just going to create more and more animosity, more and more hatred, more and more dehumanization of each other to make it even more difficult. You're already working with people that are kind of in this point of trying to work through trauma. And so to even be able to do that point, there has to be able to have at least a stop of what's happening right now. Um, and I think also, and hopefully out of that, we can also get the recognition, the recognition that this process has been going on, you know, of this control of trying to occupy, of trying to kind of use military and violent means to keep people contained for 40 years, 50 years. I mean, I mean, I mean argue when you could say it started. Um, it hasn't worked. I mean, so if we can't see, if, you know, if we don't try to do something different, generally from something, then then it's the definition of, you know, what they say of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, trying to you know, get different results. And so, um, yeah. And uh, just one clarifying question, which you kind of touched on just then was, because uh, we've spoken sometimes in, in brief just about the release of hostages, but who do, who is included in that? From what we're hearing, and again, this you know, is that it's gonna it's gonna be just like the last time there was gonna be people that were that are prisoners taken to keep prisoners, people that have been taken by the Israeli defense government, defense forces and government in exchange for hostages that were taken by Hamas. So that's my understanding. I don't know, Susan, if you have more to add to that. I mean clarity, but and, and that's similarly in terms of long term of our of our asks and our and our uh, objectives here when we say release of hostages, we're seeking the, the release of, of uh, prisoners being held, on, uh, Palestinian prisoners being held by Israel as well as yes. the hostages taken on October 7th. 
by Hamas. Long before October 7th, Israel was holding Palestinians without charge. And then after October 7th in the West Bank, as I'm sure many people listening know, the number of arrests in the West Bank have skyrocketed because of more settler violence, more IDF raids, and just more intimidation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We we had a question earlier about uh, specifically the Catholic hierarchy, but there's a a broader question several people have touched on of kind of uh, how do we get Christian leaders and Christian communities to speak out more on this issue. Um, and even within that, you can touch on different parts of this as, as you feel um, able, but are there gr groups of Christians uh, who are acting contrary to the unity of those Christian communities and the, and the uh, work for peace and the, uh, the message of peace that you're getting from the Christian, Palestinian Christians you met with? Uh, I think that means groups in the United States, uh, but maybe also there. Yeah. I, I'd like to try to answer the first part about how do we get uh, um, more uh, leadership in our churches to speak out. Don't doubt your voice. Uh, your voice matters so much in this moment. And that was said to us when we were having all of these fancy meetings with leadership, uh, uh, either church leadership or political leadership uh, in Jerusalem and the West Bank, uh, that they were bringing up um, the, the the power of the people in the streets uh, was uh, made a strong impression on them and gave them hope. I would say similarly uh, in our churches, um, I mean, look at what's happened in Congress. After October 7th, you could not say the word ceasefire on Capitol Hill. No one, no one would talk about it. It just wasn't allowed. We're now up to 66 members of Congress who are calling for a ceasefire, including five senators. And in those senators, um, one, uh, Van Hollen of Maryland, a close friend of Joe Biden. So keep chipping away at it. And in our church, uh, you know, uh, in the U.S. Catholic uh, Church, our bishops conference, they've put out two or three statements and they've called for a cessation of violence. Uh, and uh, we, uh, you may already know we have two bishops um, who recently put out a statement calling for a ceasefire. So that's the way it works. Uh, you chip away at it. And that's because of us. Uh, absolutely, for all of you uh, and everything you've done in your parish, in your community, um, uh, on your streets, the phone calls you've made, absolutely. And Bishop Shamali said it today, um, you know, we have to be truth tellers. And then what happens, I think, is that um, you know, building on what Susan's saying is it's, 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 it's speaking out in our, in our local communities. I mean, one of the things that I've been most impressed by with uh, our the director, the executive director for CMEP, uh, uh, Dr. May Cannon, um, Reverend Dr. May Cannon, is she'll preach in any church anywhere. Um, and yes, there, and this gets to the second part of that question. Yes, there are churches that um, see a sense that we've got to get all the Jewish folks back to Israel so that they, the end times can become. There's a certain amount of that um, millennialist um, kind of apocalyptic thinking. Um, and so they see they're often not working on this stuff, but she's confronted to work with some of those folks and be able to talk to them how this is not really what is helping the situation. So it's going to take that kind of um, kind, um, kind of open but strong kind of conversations uh, across these church bodies and in our churches. I also think it, takes, it starts by taking the little steps. I mean, you know, people say, well, why isn't it preached upon in my church? Well, okay, that, that's a bigger thing sometimes for people to get a the complexity of this situation. Can you at least put it the prayers of the faithful that we pray for an end to the violence um, in Gaza, just so it gets on people's minds um, and in our hearts, and the power of that can be incredible. So don't underestimate the power of even that prayer in that. Let's be seen. Thank you both. There are so many questions coming in. It's clear we need to uh, keep talking about this not just here, but in our faith communities and among us and keep informing ourselves. I know uh, we put a list of links to um, some of the resources that were mentioned about some of the actions you can take 
in the chat. So I hope people saw that. Maybe we could put that again. It's possible at the end here. Uh, and I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions. Uh, there were a lot of them, but thank you both. And I don't know if you have any final words to leave us with today. We will send a follow-up uh, email to everyone who registered with the links to everything that was in the chat and the call to action. And as Russ said, to the recording and to the slides, we'll hand it all over. Now, I just want to say thank you all for coming here. It's, um, I mean, humbled by the attendance and I'm humbled to have been a part of this. I'm getting to know the people with the Holy Land in new ways. I mean, one of the things that's always fascinating is like a lot of Christians go there and they're surprised to find Christians in the Holy Land. Um, and they'll ask the question of, when did you, when did your family become Christian? I said, oh, you know, about the year 70. Um, so I think it's for us to remember that it's a living community. It's a living community that is a part that we're a part of and they're a part of us. I think that solidarity can also give us the strength and hope to try to move forward. Um, I think those conversations can can hopefully get us to that peace that we all long for. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you, everybody, for participating today. Keep working for peace and praying for peace.